welcome everybody. Uh, again, my name is Giles Pruitt. I'm Vice Principal at Jumeirah College in Dubai. One of my key roles there is taking account for pastoral care and student support. I have 15 years approximately experience in pastoral care as a resident boarding housemaster, a housemaster, and now a vice principal with that key responsibility. So it's something I'm very passionate about and something I have um, a significant amount of experience in. The presentation today is about creating a network of student support. Um, later on, I will introduce our college counselor and a member of our student team. But in the real spirit of collaboration and you getting to talk to the person next to you and working out a few ideas about student support, can I ask you to do one thing? Everybody's got one single post-it uh, on the front of their presentation. If you'd like to talk to the person next to you, or behind you, or in front of you, and try to encapsulate what you think support for a student in an educational context really means. What do you think support for a student in a school, a college, college of higher education, secondary school, primary school, what do you think support actually means to you as an educator. And all I want you to do uh, is talk for 60 seconds or so and then jot down either a key word or a key phrase on your post-it and I'm going to come and harvest this information and put it onto the board. So please share your ideas with your partner, person next to you, jot something down on the post-it and then we're going to come and collect them and harvest that information. What does student support mean to you? Has so everyone got a post-it? It's the first thing. <laughs> it can be a word, a term, or a phrase, or a series of, a series of words that you think student support means. Ooh, super. My, my team are going to come around and collect your, collect your post-its in a minute. If you think you've got something hand it over and we'll pop it onto the harvesting board. A word or a phrase or a series of words that you think encapsulate student support. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. Any more responses? If you have... Perfect, thank you. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you very much. If you get an opportunity or you haven't quite finished, you can put them up at any time you like during the presentation. Just wander up to the board. Perfect. Thank you. And pop them onto the... Perfect. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. I've asked one of our students to come here today. Rather than listen to me preach to you about what I believe good and useful support is in an educational community. I've asked one of our students to come, and I haven't coached her, and I haven't briefed her, and I haven't given her any information to say, or you need to say this, or need to say that. All I said was this simple question. This is Abigail, by the way. We'd like to welcome Abigail here. And I said to Abigail, you've been at Jumeirah College for six years. How do you feel you have been supported as a student at our college for that length of time? That's the only question I've asked her. So, Over to you. Well, I first got this competition, and to start with, it was really hard, because six years, there's so many ways that my school supported me, but I narrowed it down to four things. So firstly, and some may say most importantly, is academic success. The support that the teachers offer me, like staying after school, doing revision classes, going above and beyond what they need to do, supported me, and it's evident when I get my grades back that that has been a great support. 
Secondly is during the PSHCE lessons. Um, PSHCE stands for Personal, Social, Health and Citizenship Education. Um, and over the six years we've discussed so many topics about substance abuse and body image issues to other things such as maintaining um, good uh, goals and achieving them and planning your time well. And this community brought us together. Um, so then for the rest of our lives we have these techniques and tactics we can use to make the best we can be. Thirdly uh, was leadership opportunities. Now, at JC there's so many leadership opportunities. Since year seven, I've been part of the year council where I've seen ideas from the students physically take action and how they've actually been implemented, which is a great support for us because we can see something that started off just as an idea bouncing around physically take shape. Also in year 11, I was a student leader and we helped organize different committees such as the charity committee or the media committee. And just last week, the application process started for the head boy and head girl positions at Jamara College. Um, even right now, there's an opportunity that I'm speaking to an audience such as you, which at other schools I may not have been supported for. And all these opportunities come together, which makes us some of the best students we can be because we're supported by our leaders and our coaches. Um, to be who we are, but to be the best of who we are. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Interestingly, just very quickly looking through the information that you've delivered here, just picking out some key things. Emotional support, health and well-being, counselling, emotional support, emotional support, clearly through this mechanism, you can see that a lot of these ideas that we have for support is for being there for the student, listening to the student when something uh, arises, a crisis arises. However, support has transformed in educational institutions across the last decade to mean so much more than just providing a listening ear. The difference I see it is very much about being proactive rather than reactive in the way in which you deal um, with development of students. And you can see some significant uh, changes in educational practice and pedagogy that have actually led to this. A little bit of context about our school. If you've never heard of Jumeirah College before, obviously it's part of the GEMS group of schools. It's 14 years old, one of the oldest international um, GEM schools in the UAE. We follow a British curriculum. It's co-educational from 11 to 18. And we have 1,200 students approximately year on year in the college. And we hold a DSIB outstanding rating. And I haven't put that on there to show off that, wow, what an amazing school it is. The key parts about that are we've had this year two separate accreditations, one from the British school overseas, which had a significant focus on safeguarding child protection and student welfare and in each of those key areas we were rated to be outstanding so we must be doing something right it's not a question of us showing off and saying wow how amazing we are but we're doing something right to provide this network of support for our students to me that encapsulates my entire presentation it's a pretty interesting statement would anybody like to offer what might be the following response to that without looking ahead on the slides on your pages. That encapsulates me what I think student support is and hence why I've used the term a network. Putting students at the centre of everything you do in educational practice in terms of leadership opportunities, delivering the curriculum, safeguarding, creating a safe site ensuring that students get a tremendous amount of opportunity. And this is what we endeavor to do as part of the leadership group at our school, is to put these students right at the center of all the educational practice. So how do you do that? And why do we do that? What drives this philosophy? And one of the key changes, I think, in education in the last, certainly the last decade, is the shift to put the children at the center of the learning. We've gone away from the didactic rote learning where the teacher is the, the master to very much about putting students at the centre of everything in the educational development. So when we're talking about delivering technology in the classroom, for example, or student-led learning or student-centred learning, 
Um, Abigail was talking there about the, the teaching and the way that the teaching is delivered. It's much more about akin to the needs of the student rather than the, the needs of the teacher. In 2004, the emphasis in the British curriculum changed after the Children's Education Act. This is us from a British-centred curriculum to the concept of every child matters. You've probably heard that today being delivered to you in some of the other, other seminars. And again, this single shift to putting the children at the centre of everything that you do. One really interesting point, when I was reviewing the safeguarding policy of the Department for Education this year, there's a new concept uh, which we were talking to our staff about in our child protection training, which is this idea of failure to thrive. Now, originally, I think the idea of this is about physical failure to thrive, but I see it as much, much deeper than that, about how you allow a student every single opportunity you can and put that at the heart of your educational practice. We would see ourselves as a, of a fairly strong academic school, but that doesn't belittle the other elements of a student's holistic upbringing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. And finally, here in the UAE, I attended a seminar before Christmas about um, the importance of child protection and safety. And there's a significant shift in practice here in the UAE um, in the concept after the Wadima law from the higher ministry uh, was generated. And now we have various different initiatives. Um, I was listening only today to a seminar looking at the um, Women and Children's Shelter and Protection Unit that's been set up, and so many changes to educational practice here in the UE, which is aligned with much more global, uh, global uh, political drive. Importantly, we're not doing this because DSIB say you have to do it and you have to prove it. We're doing it because we think it's right. However, Obviously, with our cyclical annual DSIB inspection, there are key components of the quality indicators that link to providing a support for the students. And number five, really, is the one I want to focus on in more detail. And that is how we protect and support our students by creating this network across our educational institution. 5.1 uh, is the health and safety component of this from the quality indicators. And this year, we've started to design a new child protection program at our school, which is on three tiers. And the very first tier is what I believe to be the most important, and that is every single member of our educational community, not just the teachers, so it's the assistant teachers, the support staff, the cleaners, the caterers, have had exactly the same child protection training. And that is a 45-minute presentation on key basic expectations, what to do in emergency situations, such as evacuations, how to handle medical emergencies, and what to do if you are worried about a student and their development and their growth. And that is everybody, not just the teachers. And that's our commitment to the students, that we know that every single member of our community has the opportunity to do that. So we have a, what we call a regular and transparent training cycle, which we make sure all of our staff undergo through that time frame. We have a college counselor. This is Mrs. Emma Gregory over here. And talking and going back to the very beginning of this and seeing student support, I know the counsellor has mentioned a number of times on your, your harvesting of information. And we see the counsellor rather than a listening ear and the person you can go to, but we see it as much more of a proactive role in the college to get out into the community and to try and generate support for our students through her process. I didn't coach Mrs. Gregory in any way on this. I just asked her a very similar question to Abigail. What do, what do you believe is, is a really good or useful way of, of being proactive uh, as a college counsellor? Over to you, Emma. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm going to stand close to you because I've got to get you on the mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, as Mr. Pruitt said, he, he asked me how, in my role, I make counselling accessible to the students. As he said, I do have an open door policy. I'm located in Jamira College at the back of the library, which is a very busy library in Jamira College, as Abigail will tell you. I have an open door policy where students can come and go whenever they feel like. Obviously, there are students that do struggle and do struggle with confidence and may not feel it that they can come to me because of where it's located, that somebody might see them, etc., etc. So I. I have myself personally, I've developed um, a 
marketing system where I have, uh, what do you call them, post boxes that run the school and students can access them, they can, the small little note to me, I will, read, I will read them and I will get information back to them confidentially, everything is confidential. But with Shire students, I've also developed a poster system that I can put on the back of toilet cubicle doors, which has links to certain websites that reputable sources. So issues such as um, bullying, depression, anything that they need advice, guidance, they can access without any of their friends, peers, anything knowing, and they know that I am also there. I also uh, liaise with a lot of the local, uh, local counselling networks, the communities, like with the agencies that are around in the area. I speak to them, I go to visit them, I meet up with the GEMS and Talim counselling, the school, there's counsellors from around the school there. If I feel uncertain of anything or it's a new, new problem, an issue that I've never dealt with before, I will turn to them for advice. And we generally have a big counselling network in as many schools as we can and I have access to in the area. Thank you very much. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. The, the key point here really is about proactive mentoring. It's not <laughs> you come to me when there's a problem, reactive mentoring. There's a crisis emerges, we will deal with it. We want to try and avoid those and try and develop the student support network so that we can continue to build on that framework. We, of course, have a number of providers, as all your schools do, transportation services, catering services, and uh, we have a, an external provider for all of our educational trips called EcoVenture, and we ensure that their health and safety policy and their child protection policy is transparent and exactly clear and aligned with what we want to do at our school, so we know that we're all saying the same or giving the same message. GEMS have a huge parent engagement program, and... We see parents as very much part of our, our college community and our college network, as do many of our, um, our other schools in the group. Parent engagement is more than bringing parents into a parents' evening and telling them how well their children are doing. It's actually helping to support and develop the parents' understanding of what we do as a college, not only through the academic forum, but also in all of our delivery of the pastoral curriculum which we have at the college. And finally, this, this whole concept of a network. How do we create a network? And my understanding of this is to create a, a catchment area so that every single student is catered for and accounted for in our day-to-day -day and our weekly practices. So how do we actually do that? Well, just going back to my original diagram, if you think about a horizontal network to start with, the very first port of call for our, our students is their form tutor. They are their academic mentor, they are their listener, they are their support um, network. They see them twice a day and they have a form time of uh, 25 minutes every lunchtime with which to look at academic progress, talk about problems, uh, deliver information. And they're their first port of call. Then they are directly fed into the head of year, who's accounted for 150, 160 students per year group, and then on to me. I have a weekly meeting with each of my heads of years, all the way through the school from year seven to year 13, and the very first question I always ask them is this. Do you have any student concerns? I also then have a weekly meeting with Emma as the college counsellor. And in this way, we have, a, we have a vertical structure through the college with the college counsellor, the school nurse, the medical team, the physical education department, and our house staff, so that all the time, every individual student, if there is a problem that is going to arise or some issues that are, uh, you could relate to, a great example is someone's underachieving in their academic work, I would get this information fed to me through the head of year and I'd realise that this person's also had uh, communications with Emma because they're not happy at home or they're having problems from an elder brother or sister or somebody's giving them a hard time in school. And we very quickly build up a support picture for the individual and put in place a structure that we can develop to help move them forward. This is a proactive mentoring system, not a reactive one. Building a picture of something that could occur and helping students to develop in that. That's how we create the network across the college to ensure that every one of those 1,200 students, we have information. Is it infallible? Can I catch everybody in this net? 
there's a philosophical question for you. I would hope to be able to capture as many students as we can. As part of the DSIB quality indicators, this delivering, I was just going to give you one example of how we do this, because I'm aware that there may be some questions that you'd like to ask at the end of the session. And one of the good examples is how do you promote healthy living amongst students um, in, in the college? Well, as mentioned earlier on, we have a PSHCEE programme, Personal Social Health, Cultural and Economic Education, delivered to every year seven students for one hour a week, and then in every form time at least twice a week for every single year group. And part of that is elements of healthy living, exercise, nutrition, um, awareness about body shape and body type and changes. And they all go hand in hand with, we cross that through the academic curriculum and, and are able to link some of the key aspects of that, particularly in subjects that have a similar interest. So in science, in key stage three, looking at healthy, healthy mind, healthy body, the concept of nutrition, and through our physical education program. We also... This leads me on to my very last point about going full circle to a new model that you may have seen being delivered through many schools. And this is called the student entitlement model. And the student entitlement model, again, looks at the opportunity to build capacity within your school to ensure that every student gets the opportunity to take part in debating, public speaking, musical activities and events, sporting activities and events, to make sure that every student who's not necessarily going to be the most able or gifted academic is given an opportunity to thrive within that framework. Last year we had as our parent engagement program, I'm just going to say there we had a get fit with the principal afternoon, but I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm just going to skip, skip through this last slide because I would like to move on to the last bit um, about incentives to succeed. And coming back, I know there was a presentation today on developing a house system. We see the house system as an additional layer of support for student entitlement. We have a flat horizontal system of pastoral care from tutor to year group head to vice principal to principal, ultimately. That's how it works across that every single year group. But we've also tried to develop this vertical system of integrating students across year groups because nothing is more important than being able to talk to peers who are older and younger and developing those types of community engagement. And our house system has undergone a bit of a revolution in the last uh, two years to try and provide those types of opportunities to interact uh, vertically as well as horizontally. Leadership, of Abigail said, as part of this student entitlement model is really important giving the opportunity for students all the way through the school. I've essentially written a hierarchy of our leadership opportunities that we provide in our, in our college, going from the very top to our student executive, the head boy and head girl, right the way through to peer mentors in year 11 who sit in classes with younger students and work through those uh, particular academic concerns and models and program. And finally, this is our um, house system, part of vertical integration, having lots and lots of tiered events so that students can involve in uh, inter-house music, inter-house sports competitions, debating. For this year, we introduced a whole school debating, which every single student in the college took part in a debate in their form. The top form performers went into the year and then flowed through into a whole school final at key stage three, four, and five. Very effective, great way to create uh, entitlement and engagement through, through the college. If I could summarise my understanding of support and how we develop a support network in our college, it's, it's more than just being there and a listening ear. It's about being proactive and not reactive. And interestingly, reading through the educational act that's come out of the Wadima law, the key point in there is one key phrase I picked out from that was, this is a shared responsibility of everybody in your institute. It's not just the leaders at the top, but it's every single person who is responsible for the care of that individual student. How, how do you go about generating this? Build capacity, create engagement opportunities for students so that they are able to take part. Does that mean I force them to do it? No, but if there are multiple matrixed activities that every student can catch, it's an opportunity for students to be able to do that. Clear and transparent training across your whole network in your school, not just teachers. 
There's more to safeguarding and protection than just that. Safeguarding is a key responsibility. It's a proactive responsibility, not a reactive one. I've mentioned that previously. And finally, see if you can create a generate a student network to allow your students to be captured into this entitlement model where they can be supported and have an opportunity to thrive. That is it. Questions from the floor? I hope I haven't bamboozled you with too much information. Do we have any questions about any elements of the slides, any detail elements? If you want to stay behind afterwards and ask a question of me directly, more than happy to do so. Yes? Hi. Um, we tried out a student questionnaire this mm -hmm. year because we were concerned that we weren't, you know, you said you hope to be picking up all the yes. students, but can you be certain? And that highlighted for us there were lots of students who were high achieving, who had lots of social emotional barriers, mm -hmm. which we wouldn't have picked up yeah. without the questionnaire. So that flagged concerns for us because we thought, had we not participated in this trial, we would never have known, or how would we mm. have known? Have you faced anything like that? Or do you have something in place to eliminate that? Well, a lot of the, well, we do a lot of audits in the school. So we have a, a, individual student questionnaire audits for each one of our departments when we do, an I, we do something called the IQA cycle, which is our individual quality assurance cycle. And every student through each one of those gets an opportunity. Uh, we're using Google Docs to do this now, and we set up a series of questionnaires that students can feed back about issues associated with classroom teaching, um, issues, that's, and it's completely confidential, uh, so that we can garner a lot more feedback from students. So that's the way we've done it originally. We haven't seen any significant data to see that there are issues associated with that yet. I mean, most of the, most of the detail that we pick up in social and emotional issues come, tend to come through the pastoral network, either through the heads of year or through the student councillors. But that sounds like a really, really positive way of doing things. So t tell me a little bit more about the data that you found. Mm -hmm. okay. And what it picked up, because it looks at four quadrants, so yep. one is the academic, so you've got school life, home life, and then you've got personal life, family life, and with school it's academic and peers. Mm -hmm. And what it picked up was that there were lots of things in the peer quadrant that we weren't aware of, so things like cyberbullying and things like that, which students were keeping to themselves, but they noted on this questionnaire. And then things around the home, so you know, like my older brother hits me around sure. the home, or my mum and dad are never there. So things like that, which we didn't have a facility or perhaps, you know, we have a student counsellor who's fantastic, but maybe these students had never shared that with anyone. Sure. So it picked up those two mm. quadrants, which we didn't have a forum for in school. But it's highlighted a lot of students who the council is now having to pick up. So it was quite alarming for us because of that. Did you say there was a link between educational attainment and the information you were finding yeah, as well? We had lots of high achieving students who obviously, you know, they do well with their targets, they do well with their studies. So, you know, they have their one-to-one -one meetings with their um, tutor or their head of year, and because they're doing well academically, you know, they high flyers, they're in our top sure. ten percent. They don't flag as a concern yeah. student, yeah. whereas. This questionnaire highlighted students who have, tend to have poor academic attainment. We associate with problems when we don't yeah, see it the other way around. Know those students, yeah, of course. These were like, there was an unknown quantity of students. Mm. Do you have a gifted and talented program at your school? We had some programs, but not kind of one for. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, we have a gifted and talented program that tends to pick up and deal with that bulk of students, but it's only a very small number. So we would look at that in terms of delivery of academic. Um, or changes to the academic curriculum to try and support them, but there's a wider programme. So we have a uh, Model United Nations programme, we have a um, Debate Dubai programme, we have a whole series of things that tend to capture these students, which, which, which make them... I think it's all part of this whole concept of engagement. If you're, you're talking about what I'm, I'm hearing there is that you've got significant students with high attainment that perhaps are not getting or getting the benefit fully and therefore are finding there is an emotional attachment to some of those ideas. It's a really fascinating thing. Or well, some students who are high attainment yeah. and are top tier and are in things like the MUN, but they feel there's too much pressure from home. Mm. It's too much. Yeah, I mean... I, yeah. They we, feel overwhelmed. It's interestingly, one of the biggest... Challenges I think we face in a secondary school setting, I don't know if you find the same, is, is getting parents into school to share in the educational experiences. We find that parent engagement in the junior schools, uh, you know, there's always families coming in to visit and find out a little bit more about it. But in secondary schools, there's a massive drop-off. 
And the significant thing when we get feedback questionnaire from parents is that what is it that you want from this college? And is I want the best A-level grades for my student. Yeah. And they don't see the wider picture. And that is, that is where the parent engagement program is so important to try and educate parents to say, well, hang on, it's a bit wider than that. There's so many other things that students have become involved with. And I think the fundamental issues that we have associated with higher attaining students is being pushed so hard that, uh, that they are, they are you know, sort of broken instruments, as it were. And I think we, we, what we're trying to do is capture that through our, our horizontal and vertical programs so that we can deal with those, those type of issues. Because it is a high expectation of, of families here, I found in, in, in Dubai particularly, is that you know, we want students to get the best possible grades and we don't really mind about anything else that goes on with it. And so trying to face those challenges is, is quite hard. I think it's a very valid point. Any other questions or things you'd like to share with the audience? Yes? How do you believe the hyperactive child in a normal class? Hyperactive child in a normal class. You're asking a, a, you're asking a specific question that I probably don't have the skill set to answer. Uh, in terms of our, I mean, we have, a, we have a support for learning program in our community. Uh, do you have one of those in your school as well? And we're using specific specialists to deal with students with those types of emotional and behavioural problems. Um, from, a, from a college context, we have a very small percentage of students that will be on that particular type of spectrum. Uh, most of the work that we deal with with students are those that have more cognitive and processing difficulties, not necessarily those with the emotional and behavioural difficulties. Um, and so that was really the dimension of the support for learning team. And you have a head of support for learning in your school? Yes. So they, they are the people that should be intervening and making sure that those individual students are catered for appropriately within, this, within the classroom context. That's just, a, that's just a, an opinion that I would have from my, from my own uh, educational context. There was also the little talk on ADHD. Yeah. You might have an yeah. opportunity to do that, yeah. Perfect. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, do you have specific tools to measure the impact of postural care? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, the, the, yeah. It is, very much so. And I think when you're, when you're coming back to give, um, one, of, one of the challenges of giving feedback from, I'll give you an example from the BSO inspectors that came in this year, was how, how do you measure the impact of pastoral care? And we have a lot of it is. Um, we have a lot of intervention that goes on in our school between heads of year, tutors, uh, from, a, from a pastoral con context. And so m much of the data we tend to go on is value-added data. So it'll be linked to academic attainment, which is sort of not really answering your questions so much about past how do you prove that pastoral care works within the concept of the school. Um, I think the, the, the key area is for us, the student feedback questionnaires are the, is, the, is the information we get the most to see student satisfaction surveys. Yeah, as part of as part of our IQA cycle, as part of the GEMS um, student questionnaire, there is one annually published by our school for students as part of the DSIB. No, try and encourage as many students as possible to do it. Um, I think we're looking at about normally about 20% response. Uh, from as, as the lead into the DSIB inspection, um, and then everything else we do through our own individual quality assurance questionnaire. We've now created this live forum that students can actually go in and do this in in lesson time and in downtime, so that they can feedback on certain departments and uh, the quality of the educational provision. And they're the, they're the key indicators for us. That gives us the, the, the amount of data. In terms of a, a tool to measure effective pastoral support. Only, only via our heads of year and the intervention that they put in place with students, and then we measure that against academic attainment and see what impact that's had in terms of value-added care, if you see what I mean. But good question, though. I'd love to see it. I'd love to find a tool that you could, you could find to measure effective pastoral care. I, I, haven't, yet, I haven't yet found one that's, uh, that's been that effective and, and widely used internationally. You sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. There is a three-tier program on child protection. Yes. That you have any provision Yeah, we haven't done that specifically. What, what we've started with this year is that the, the commitment to every single member of our college community, staff-wise, not just teaching staff, are delivered a baseline child protection, which is delivered by Emma and myself. 
what we're going to try to address more bespoke pastoral issues with our key heads of year. Student, well, what we do have, we have an outreach program of our student leaders, and our student leaders do go, in, go into other schools and deliver, not necessarily with, in terms of child protection, but it's more about support and uh, engagement and leadership. I think leadership is the, key, is the key component, and many of our students go out through, through the GEMS network of schools and, and, and deliver those, yeah. Is this something that you would like to have in your school? Yes. Why don't you leave me your email address afterwards, and I can get in touch with you and see what's on offer. Of course you can, yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Okay, we're running out of time. Are there any final thoughts? Uh, so, uh, in, in different, can, I mean, uh, other countries I have seen uh, the child abuse cases are being dealt uh, in connection with the community, like yep. the Department of Community Services. How is it being done in Dubai? Well, in fact, there's significant changes. One, I think the biggest shift I found, and this was very much part of the the talk that was given in the auditorium uh, earlier today, was that previously I think institutes educational institutes were very cautious of reporting any issues of child abuse or neglect to the local authorities because immediately it became a police matter. The shift now is that there is a specific educational unit that is in place to deal with those uh, elements. Every school, in theory, should have a child protection officer. Our child protection officer is our, our college principal. When GEM schools, it's very different because we would then feed that to our support team at our corporate headquarters, which are essentially our governors or our trustees. Um, but for individual schools, there is a child, there's a specific child protection centre now, um, and the information will be available here. If you go and ask the organisers, they will probably put you in touch with the lady who delivered this from the Child Support Services group who was doing the lecture earlier on today. And there is actually uh, helpline numbers and specific uh, support groups that will deal with those things. So that's essentially how it's handled here in, in Dubai. Okay. Great. Thank you very so much. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed your day. Well done, team.